Listen only mode. Welcome. This is our Crisis Coach webinar series conduct, conducted in uh, association with the RenWeb Group. Today we're going to be discussing why business intelligence makes you so dumb. This is the fifth in the 2016 series of, of the Crisis Coach webinars. Our presenter today is going to be Karen Masulo. She's our Executive Vice President. Firestorm would like to have you as a friend. Follow us on Facebook at Firestorm Solutions, and you can twit with us, tweet with us on Firestorm Soul. There is a hashtag. That hashtag is Crisis Coach. Firestorm empowers you to manage risk and crises. Firestorm expertise is crisis management, critical decision support, crisis communications, crisis public relations, and consequence management. Our lawyers make us remind you that the presentation today is not complete without the accompanying oral comments and discussion. And this information should be read and considered in conjunction with guidance and advice from your organization's personal counsel. In addition, please do not interpret this information as legal advice or legal opinion. RenWeb is a underwriter and host of this webinar series. This is the fifth of the 2016 series. You can go to Firestorm.com and watch past webinars, even from prior years, and you can also register for future webinars. Scott, unfortunately, is out uh, today. So, Karen, do you want to say something nice about the RenWeb Group and uh, how talented they are and what wonderful services they have? Well, I think I can do a little bit of that. Uh, we have, and thank you, Bill, I appreciate it. Uh, Firestorm has a terrific uh, long relationship with our partners at RenWeb. Uh, RenWeb, blah, blah, it's, RenWeb is very hard for me to say, especially three times fast, uh, but they have terrific school management software, as you know, uh, those of you who are on the call today. Out of all of the sessions that I have done this week on this subject, you actually have the greatest advantage because you have a software uh, partnership with RenWeb that allows you to access your critical data that you need in a clean and immediate manner, um, it better uh, or more advantageous than many organizations that we deal with. So in that regard, uh, you have a step above, and we look forward to doing uh, much more with RenWeb in the future. Also, our uh, president and CEO, Jim Satterfield, has been honored to be a keynote speaker at many of your conferences, and we look forward to meeting more of you personally at upcoming conferences uh, throughout the year. I am Karen Masuo. I am the Chief Intelligence Officer uh, and the Executive Vice President of Predictive Intelligence for Firestorm. My team does a variety of things, and one of the things that we do is assist uh, businesses and schools create and gather data that allows us to analyze it carefully. That is my English language just went away. Um, and create actionable insights for you. Uh, last year, we kept three guns out of different organizations. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but anything from um, issues that may have to do with sexting or issues of concern in that regard to instances of violence and bullying, racism, and others, as we can help you through data to anticipate behaviors of concern, we do. And we are here to be your partner in that regard. So let's talk a little bit about partnering. Uh, with humans and technology, and sometimes why too much technology, too much data, too much information can make us a little bit dull or dumb. And the image you see on your screen is taken from the cover of a magazine called the Insurance Research Letter put out by Insurance Services Network. It's a hard copy uh, magazine. You can find a link to it on the front of our website on firestorm.com, and it links not only to the article, but to the issue. And this particular issue features our CEO, 
Harry Ruin on the cover. And it features a quote from Harry um, that reads, technology is changing faster than anyone realizes. The rate of change is one of the biggest exposures the world faces today. Individuals, even those working in the technology field, are no longer able to forecast what vulnerabilities and threats are of the technologies that are being created. Interestingly, Hollywood does a better job forecasting our exposures than people do. And I think Harry is a bit of a Terminator fan uh, when I read that. Um, but it's a really, it's a, it's a significantly important message because technology is moving so very quickly. And it's not just technology, it's the amount of data that we're managing. And how do we put that into perspective? Five exabytes of content were created between the birth of the world and 2003. In 2013, five exabytes of content were created every day. You need to just think about that for a moment. We're so curious. We're curious to create information that other people can use. We're curious and we create misinformation just to see how people will use it. This curiosity is, a, is an interesting thing about us. We want information. We want to find it and we want to create it. And generally that curiosity is a useful thing. You know, in, in, in our past, it was important for us to understand data that we analyzed so that we could understand if the rustling in the leaves behind us was a predator or of prey. These were life-changing pieces of information. We're wired to look for information to reduce uncertainty because our minds are adapted for a, a earlier, more hazardous time, although if any of you have been to any major city recently, I think we still live in relatively hazardous times. But we want to fill in information so that we can protect ourselves, those we love, our tribes, as it were. And we're fascinated with filling in any gaps that we have, any information gaps. And that obsession with information gaps can lead us a little bit astray at times, especially when reducing uncertainty has become far too easy. And the reason for that is twofold. And we're going to talk about a study that was done around this in just a moment. But something that happens when there's too much information available to us is it actually will slow our decision-making process. And in a crisis, you need clarity of vision so that you can make decisions quickly. We call this massive amount of data that's thrown at us every day, this, it's the seduction of data. And in school business as usual, when you're operating your, your school or your schools or your campus or campuses or your district, what data do you use in a normal day to make decisions? Now, I also realize that with school districts, there's really never a normal day. There's always something interesting going on. So what, what, what data do you use to make decisions? You, know, I mean, you might have stats on, on sports teams that you use to make specific decisions on maybe how you invest resources. You have stats on the number of students who may participate in a specific activity that allows you to understand how you may manage resources related to that. The interesting thing about how much data is out there to help you make these decisions, with, which are seemingly simple decisions at their essence, is that every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data. Now, unless you're someone who works with the national debt, I don't know that 2.5 quintillion bytes of data actually makes any sense. But to give us some concept, uh, co uh, to give us some context, uh, the marketing executives at Voucher Cloud say that 2.5 quintillion bytes of data would fill 10 million Blu-ray discs, the height of which stacked would measure the height of four Eiffel Towers stacked on top of each other. Well, thanks, but that doesn't really help me. That's still an awful lot of stuff. 
90% of the world's data today has been created in the last two years alone. So in business as usual, we have all of this data to pull from to make decisions. So what do we use in business as unusual or in a crisis situation? Do you know? Have you mapped it out for your school? Do you know what data you use if a tornado is coming? We have a lot of good data from weather services that help us to make these decisions. How about a sexting crisis? What data do you use to make decisions in that? And how do you know it's the right data, especially if you've never experienced the crisis before? Let's step back just a moment and talk about the different types of data there are, just so we can put those into some clear sorts of buckets. The first is structured data. Structured data is information, usually text files, displayed in titles, columns, and rows. You know, I, I think back a, a lot of times to a guy that I worked with many, many years ago, before I worked with Firestorm, who was a brilliant guy and he was very, very organized. And we would work on a significantly large project, um, one that impacted 30,000 employees across the world. And we had to launch a service to assist these folks. And he would come back with the most amazing spreadsheets. They were multicolored in a way that there were colors we did not know Excel was able to generate, hundreds of interlinked pages of data and information with legend codes for each page in color. They were truly things of beauty for people who appreciate organized, ordered systems. And sadly, no one ever read his spreadsheets. Well, a couple of us did. They were very complex. They were almost too much data. So when you think of structured data, that's it. It's exceptionally ordered, the perfect filing cabinet, color-coded and organized. Then there's unstructured data. Unstructured data is all of the other stuff that can't be classified. For those of you, that would be videos like Periscope or YouNow. If you don't know what YouNow is, as soon as this webinar is over, you now must go to younow.com and look at it and see what it is because quite frankly it frightens me. I think it's an identified risk for students. Uh, but unstructured data also includes PowerPoint files, presentations, uh, social media. You know, we can order all of the messages we, we, we export from social media and we can look at all of those messages, but we really can't read into the intent and context of those messages without actually having human eyes to analyze it. And then we have dark data. Dark data is operational data that is not being used. Gardner, uh, Gartner describes dark data as information that an organization collects. You process it, you store it, you pay money somewhere, you've got tapes all over the place. Um, but uh, in the course of your regular activity, you fail to use it for any purpose. And to help illustrate that, uh, I made a drawing for you. Here it is. There you go. The best drawing I've done all year. OK, so all kidding aside, let's talk a little bit about managing the data now. One of the number one growing professions today, data scientists. Did a call earlier today with an organization out of New York on this subject, and one of our co-moderators, uh, who is a contingency planner, said that her daughter is now a, a data scientist, a very well-regarded one in her field. Uh, it is the number one growing field. What does a data scientist do? Well, at its most simple explanation, data scientist provides the right information to the right people at the right time for the right situation. Data is there to support timely and efficient decisions. 
And we need to assure that only the most important and relevant information goes to decision makers to support their decision making process and responsibilities. Because otherwise, we can too easily distract our leaders as they make decisions. And who does the data belong to? Well, in your school system or in your school, think about that on an individual level. Usually the first time we say information assets to someone, they think about IT. They think about the technology folks. Other people immediately say, no, it's Treasury. It's, it's definitely the finance office. Overwhelmingly, people say it belongs to finance. Second in line would be technology or information services. Then operations, marketing, HR, and some other folks in there. What we'd like to see is everybody sitting at the table equally because everyone has information that may be relevant to a situation. If you get everyone at the table before a crisis occurs and identify what type of information they have and they use, you can then say, hey, if we have X crisis, Team A that responds to that with data should be comprised of the following groups. They may have data that's important to that specific crisis. And then with your team of everyone at the table, you sit down and map out each potential crisis to your organization and what data might be needed in order to facilitate decision making during a crisis. We then reduce silos. Additionally, one of the problems with siloed information is you may miss things. We'll talk about that in more detail, but think about it this way. If you have a behavioral risk, the Firestorm, we have a program called Bertha. It's Behavioral Risk Threat Assessment. We like you to think of it as Alice's big sister. But when we do a behavioral risk threat assessment, one of the parts of that program is having a central repository for information. This is very important. Why? Because what may look like an isolated single incident to one person may actually be part of a much larger pro problem, an often reported and documented problem that is missed because all of the data and information needed to make the decision is not kept in the same single place. Now, let's talk about first making that decision. Then we'll talk about where all this stuff is. There was a study that was done by Stanford University and Princeton University together. If you look up the study, Google on the pursuit and misuse of useless information. Decision makers often pursue non-instrumental information. Information that appears relevant, but if simply available, would really have no impact on choice. Once they pursue that information, people often use it to make their decision. Consequently, the pursuit of information that would otherwise have no impact on choice leads people to make choices they would not otherwise have made. What does that mean? Well, let's have a little exercise here together. So everybody, I want you, I would like you to pretend for a moment with me. I'd like you to imagine that you're on a beach. No, actually, um, I'd like you to imagine that you're a loan officer. And you are at a bank, and you're reviewing the mortgage application of a recent college graduate. Now, this college graduate has a stable, well-paying job. They've got a solid credit history. And the applicant seems qualified, but during your routine checking, you discover that for the last three months, the applicant has not paid a $5,000 debt to his charge card. Do you, A, approve the mortgage application? B, reject the mortgage application? If you are like 71% of the people in the original study, you rejected the mortgage application. Now we have a different group of people. 
And in this group of people, we have the exact same scenario with one small difference. Instead of the $5,000 no payment, there's a discrepancy. It might be $5,000, but it might be $25,000. Now, you can go ahead and make the decision right now whether to approve or reject the applicant, or you can decide to wait until tomorrow when the credit agency opens so that you can get more information. Not surprisingly, the majority of participants in this part of the study said, well, if I can put off making a decision, I'm going to put it off. So the availability of more data is also a way to buy time. I need more data. I can't make a decision today. Then, once they were given the data, which was the debt is not what $25,000 this person hasn't been paying on, but rather $5,000, which leads us right back to the original scenario. The interesting change is that now, instead of 71% rejecting the application, only 21% rejected the application. The rest approved it. That's a big change because of more data that, frankly, was completely irrelevant to the decision-making process. The greatest obstacle to the to discovery is not ignorance, but rather it is the illusion of knowledge. This additional information that came to us gave us the illusion of knowledge. Didn't make us any smarter at all. You know, in the past, technology changed slowly. The threats that were created evolved over time periods that were manageable. When someone first saw the automobile rolling down the road at its little five miles an hour, somebody smart said, you know, I bet we make those faster eventually. We probably should have some signs and maybe some rules around how you operate those. Now, something that is created today, frankly, our ability to prepare for it is obsolete by tomorrow. Somebody's already figured out how to jump into your bank account, steal all your money, and buy a better mousetrap. I kind of mixed my metaphors there, but you get the idea. Today, the rate of change has made it such that information from yesterday may indeed be useless in predicting what's going to come tomorrow. I made a graph of this for you, too. How much data do you have? That's how much confusion is growing. Unless, again, you've clearly defined what data it is that you need, because complexity does not equal clarity. And if you've ever been really hungry and gone to the grocery store, you know this is true. You buy stuff you never normally buy, so you overextend your resources, and you buy stuff that, frankly, just didn't do it for you because you buy everything you're hungry for. In order to be effective, we've got to simplify our choices. Because data without insight is risky business. Poor data equals poor analysis equals poor business decisions. Your school is a business. Your students are a part of this organization. You need to keep your doors open in a way that protects the ability of your teachers to teach, your administrators to function within the organization, to keep your children safe and well-educated. You need your parents engaged and your community in love with you. And if you have bad data, you may make assumptions that are completely wrong because they're based upon flawed data. I can look at 
our predictive intelligence practice. About five years ago, Jim Satterfield, our president, and I were sitting and talking, and we said, we've got to have a better way to assist companies predict behaviors of concern. We talked about some tools that I was using, and we made those more sophisticated. We worked with the folks that developed those tools, and we implemented the ability to be much more strategic in our analysis of data that we were receiving. Then we trained our data analysts to understand the context of conversations we were seeing. Because otherwise, one day a couple of years ago, I might have thought about a million people were talking about bringing a gun to school. However, when I looked at it and put it into context, I realized there's a band called EMUR, E-M-M-U-R-E. From my understanding, they are very terrible as far as music goes. Well, they have a song, though, that's called Bring a Gun to School. And it has been trending for almost two years now. So when we look at someone who says they're going to bring a gun to school, we have to look at it in the context of the conversation so that we're not making poor assumptions based upon some sort of flawed data. We also may be missing data. And how would we know? When we sit down with a school or a business to design what we're searching for, what the threats are, what we're concerned about, and this does not just impact social and traditional and new media. It's easy to talk about those things, however, because they're sort of right in front of us every day, and, and, and actually some of that structured data is easy to, easy to categorize. But when we sit down with a uh, school, we talk about their geography, terms that their students use for, for everything from uh, types of drug abuse uh, to other types of behaviors. And even then, we need to set a specific amount of time to watch and adjust because we don't want to miss something we don't know we don't know. So we have a period of adjustment where we can start bringing in data that we're relatively sure covers as much as we possibly can for a search period. One of the challenges, though, even when we do that, is if one group or person holds on to that data. When we work with schools, communications does not own the data. Marketing does not own the data. Finance doesn't own it. Security doesn't own it. We try to deliver it to a holistic group and then create a workflow that defines if it's this type of risk, this group sees the data. If it's this type of risk, maybe everyone sees the data, but only this specific designated group acts upon the data. By non-siloing it, by allowing the data to be shared and opened, we are less likely to be delivering flawed data, which quite frankly is just one big old distraction. If you're in the middle of a significant crisis, you don't have time to be distracted by something that's going on behind you when you need to keep your focus in front. There was a situation with a significant sexting scandal in the school system. And when they started to investigate the sexting scandal incidents, they started to confiscate smartphones. So they confiscated one smartphone and started to research it and got some more data and had to confiscate another, and another, and another, and 10, and 20, and 30. And at one point, they had 115 phones in a box. And someone in the room said, if we continue down this road, we are going to be confiscating every phone in our state. This is not the appropriate way for us to be researching this situation. Meanwhile, 
there was n there was no group that was designated to be in touch with parents. There was no group that was designated to figure out who was the victim. There was no group that was designated to talk to the police. So we had a bunch of people descending upon a situation, everybody arguing, making decisions that, quite frankly, weren't helping solve the situation. Lack of focus is a distraction. And it can distract you from, from some very significant decisions that are required to be made. Data for data's sake doesn't do anything for anybody. In a calm time, I may be feeling really good about the kind of data I have. I ask my, my security person, I say, hey, how many, how many exits do we have in this building? My security person's feeling really good about it. We have 32 exits, 18 covered by security cameras. I'm good about that until suddenly there's an emergency. And I turn back around to my security person and say, oh, my God, we're in a crisis right now. Where are those exits? And my data guy doesn't have any idea. He's only able to give me part of the data, not all of it, so that I can make good decisions. If I don't have a map, it does me no good to know how many emergency exits I have. Information plus insight equals intelligence. You're going to hear Firestorm say that quite often. The first thing we do is gather data, huge amounts of our aggregate data. We figure out a way to analyze that data, and that gives us insight, which then allows us to take action, predictive, actionable intelligence. So we need to think about how you go about making decisions in your school, in your school system. What is the formal decision-making process, or is there one? If there's not, let's work together to make one. Do you have a trusted, objective sounding board? We have a client, really large school system, and I would say once a day I get a text or an email or a phone call, just wanted to run something by you. Our, we have a couple of contracts in place, and one of those is four hours of my time a month. And he may take five or ten minutes and just say, just want to bounce something off you. How does this sound? In the middle of a crisis, and in a large school system with multiple schools, campuses, properties, uh, leased events ongoing at any given time, we know there's always going to be something that needs attention. Sometimes you just need someone else to talk to to get the clarity of vision so that you can move forward and make a decision. And then any additional ed uh, intelligence needed to make a decision? When you have time, when you have a good sounding board, you also have time to gather better data to make better decisions. Also, working with RenWeb, working with the software technology that you do, you know one box is checked. Where do we go to get some of that data? You know, in, in a crisis, most executives are trained to make de decisions based upon information, data, and policy. I mean, that's not just in a crisis, in any time. But in a crisis, Frankly, information is generally wrong. Not only is information wrong, the data is just not available. Things are moving so fast that you can't keep up. I remember um, one of the reasons Jim and I had that conversation five years ago was because one day I was watching social media. I was on Twitter, and I saw a message by, and it said, holy expletive, shots in the cafeteria. I went back to the young lady who had made that message, and her next message was, oh my God, I am so scared. 
those were the first shots fired at Chardon, Ohio. Did you know that the names of the deceased were released by students on Twitter before their parents had been notified, before the school could confirm the identities? Command and control in many crises today is lost. Once it gets away from you, it's gone. Did you know that from that one young lady who made that message, all of those organizations that monitor for news and breaking stories then went to that young lady's friends section, figured out who most likely were other students, and started messaging those students some of which were not on campus that day, but rather at home freaking out because they were just messaged by CNN or Fox News asking for an interview. Some students were in the school, on the property, in an active lockdown, shelter in place, because an active shooter was still on the ground. And CNN and Fox and other news organizations were reaching out to these kids and saying, hey, can you give us an interview via Twitter? Can I ask you some questions? And if those kids had geolocation turned on, they are blasting out their location to someone who may want to give them harm. Suddenly, brand and reputation are under attack as well. The first place everybody went was to that school's website, which immediately crashed. And almost every single situation I have seen since that has involved a major organization or a school where there has been a crisis on the property, everybody goes to the website property and crashes the server because I think people are not doing load testing. So put that on your list of data points. Because of that, the servers crashed. There were other issues. They were seen to be vulnerable and suddenly became targets for hackers, denial of service attacks. Somebody figured if I want to steal a lot of information, this is a good time. They're distracted. So suddenly when you go to your systems to get the data you need to make decisions, you can't. You're locked out of your own system. Leadership suddenly becomes involved and engaged personally. We've seen these kinds of situations where the criticism for leadership has been so strong that after a hack, leadership's personal information is then put out on the web, their phone number, their addresses, their personal emails, their social security numbers. Impacts suddenly become disproportionate. Events are quickly escalating. You are the center of media focus, and speed is quality, like never before. You need to make decisions fast. And as we said, what if that data is available during a, is unavailable during a crisis? I made another picture for you. I asked Tim Satterfield, I said, what do we do in a situation where everything's locked down? We had a situation once, another company I worked for, it was after 911. Many of you will recall we had a major blackout in the Northeast. The company I worked for at the time, our entire C-suite, CEO, CMO, CIO, however, COO, as many C-suite as you can put in the room. They were all there together. And transportation died, everything died. Fortunately, one of them lived in New Jersey. So they all walked to New Jersey. And I asked Jim, what do you do in a situation like that? He said, it's simple. You can choose this or you can choose that. Bad decision one, bad decision two, but you got to make a decision. Too much data or no data? Without a plan, you're in the same spot. And 
Firestorm believes most threats can be identified before they occur. So we have developed predictive and actionable intelligence for our school clients to help you target threats and risks before they materialize so that you have some time for intervention. What we're trying to do is buy you time in a very stressful situation so that you can take a breath. The Crisis Management Performance Maturity Rating gives us a simple view as to what it looks like when you have no plans or at least some plans. Many calls that we get are from folks with no plan at all. Everything is a surprise. And everything is developed in a reactive manner. It's a reaction to the last thing that just happened. In the middle of having an argument about how we're going to handle this, the phone rings, and now we've got to have an argument about how we're going to handle this. And experts are called in far too late and end up costing us more resources. Remember when we went to the store with no plan and we were really hungry? We ended up spending a lot more money than we had to. There are high levels of confusion, there are changing assignments, decisions and processes are not clear and are overlooked. You got two or three people doing one thing because nobody knows who's doing what and things that really need to be done aren't getting done at all because resources are not assigned effectively. It's almost impossible to obtain good or real data that's relevant to the issue. And we, we don't even know what data we need. Processes are slow. Leadership is becoming exceptionally stressed, probably haven't slept in two days. Somebody's thrown a camera and a microphone in front of them. They're not prepared. And messaging is confused. It's reactive. It's defensive. Key channels are missed. And the messages are absolutely not timely. In the second stage that we want you to start moving into is where at least you're reacting in a very basic manner. You may have gone out to the web and looked for a template for a, a crisis response or crisis management uh, program of some kind. Well, it's better than nothing. It's not custom for you. It doesn't cover your needs, but it's, at least it might be something. The roles and responsibilities are a little bit better defined. You don't quite know how much you're going to spend on this crisis, but, well, we know there's an emergency fund somewhere. And we have some basic data needs, we know. We're not able to make decisions in a very timely way. We are still reacting to events, and we are spending a lot more money than we meant to. The messaging that's coming out, it's pretty canned, and it's, pretty unpredictable, but at least we're getting messages out. You know, there was a situation recently with a school that had a pedophile on staff as an employee, not someone in the classroom. Although this person had access, unlimited access, to students whenever he wanted. Concerned teachers brought an issue to the principal of the school and said, we have concerns about this person. But because there were no standard policy plans, programs, and procedures in place, that principal said, I'll look into it. I'm going on vacation next week. I'll look into it when I get back. Now, I know there are a whole bunch of you on the phone who just gasped because you know that's illegal and just not the way we need to operate around our children. But that's what happened. And the secondary crisis that has been created, aside from the fact that the children who are victims have not been taken care of and addressed in a way that they should have been immediately, that the parents were not notified in a way they should have been immediately, that the perpetrator of the crime was allowed to continue to get away with this crime, but an entirely secondary situation has been created in terms of lawsuits, loss of student population, 
loss of resources, loss of jobs, etc. Don't let that happen to you. We want you at least in the supportive stage. We call this pre-action. You have a defined process and structure, defined decision rights, and there's little debate. There's no fighting about it. You have clearly defined roles and responsibilities. Basic data is predefined that you need. So you can get to it quickly. You can change quickly. Generally, you're making timely decisions with adequate responses. And your messaging process and channels is effective, timely. And some of the messaging is standardized because you've gone through an exercise. You've created message maps. You've created message maps that are appropriate to the different social and traditional channels. In the stage four, or strategic culture, this, this is just an example of a very small portion of a much larger document, where we sat down and we said, OK, if the fire alarm goes, what do we do? If protesters are out in front of our school, what do we do? If media comes on site to the school, School, what, what do we do? And then we have action codes assigned that we work through with the school. Those action codes represent groups of people and actions those groups of people are to take. And it doesn't matter if there are three people in the school system or 3,000 or 30,000. These action codes are populated by people who are vested in the decision-making process and know where and how to use the data associated with their process is. They have a clear playbook for major crisis types, clearly defined and established roles and priorities. Their information is predefined, and the information processes, the data processes around it, allow for fast response and unique data so they have unique new insights they can gain. They, that all leads them to a very highly efficient and timely decision process. They're able to anticipate needs instead of react. They're only consuming assigned resources that are needed. And their messaging process is clean, clear, predefined, and refined as appropriate. Wouldn't we all like to be in that, in that last group? So let us help you do that. First, let's help you predict. By participating in an assessment, you know as a RenWeb school, just let us know when you contact us at webinars at firestorm.com or if you've already got, uh, have, if you've already spoken to a Firestorm representative, just reach out to them, mention you are a RenWeb school, and the $2,500 assessment fee will be waived. Additionally, we would like to offer you special information on the behavioral risk threat assessment. We have some special things going on with that. Just to ask about it, let us know you are a RenWeb school. We'll help you analyze relevant data to, incre uh, to create insights and intelligence for your organization and help you establish an intelligence network. We're going to develop plans with specific action plans for each threat as appropriate to your organization and your budget. And then we want to help you test and train and test and train as often as possible. In that regard, we have a really cool test coming up. Last time we did one of these virtual web-based stress tests we had more than 1,000 organizations join. I loved seeing some of our RenWeb schools post pictures of their teams in conference rooms and post them to Twitter so that we could share them on our blog and in our newsletter. We look forward to that again. And on May 25th, we'll be doing part two in a virtual cyber breach exercise. So think about it. If you had a crisis and your website crashed and somebody hacked all your uh, data. Would you be able to? Um, would you be able to perform? Certainly, you have uh, RenWeb protecting you in that regard. Um, so again, as I say, you're ahead of the game. Um, but on June 14th, we're also going to be conducting a communicable illness 
stress test. So that can be your summer in service. Uh, join us on June 14th from 2 to 4. And of course, always just reach out to us on our website. You can download a brief of today's session and a recording at firestorm.com forward slash brief. We always ask you to give it a couple of hours after the session before you access that so we have time to edit and get that document up for you. And we'd like to thank, as always, RenWeb, which is a fax company. You can reach us at firestorm.com, webinars at firestorm.com. If you'd like to talk to the lovely but attractive Bill Baker, you can call our 1-800 number at 800-321-2219. And again, we're happy to answer any questions or concerns you may have. I want to thank everyone for attending today. I'm sorry I went a couple minutes over, but I hope you enjoyed our session. My name again is Karen Masulo. And this will conclude today's session. Thanks for joining and have a great day.